would encourage you not to just go in your pocket and see what you have left over, but think, you know, every month I'm going to set aside X amount to give people in this church just to help out. And it doesn't have to be a lot because whatever you give is more than you were given or it's going to be consistent. You could say, I'll give five bucks a month. I'll give 25 bucks a month. I'll give 50 bucks a month. It would be nice that that fund is always stocked and ready to help somebody out when the time comes. That's what benefits them. But being generous and kind, it's more blessed to give than receive. All right. I gave up on the news for a long time. Yeah, right? And even now, I, I'm not following it like I used to. But man, it's so nasty and depressing. And news I heard the last couple of weeks kind of inspired a sermon. It was the headlines. So I went online to, to get the headlines. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Here we go. NPR. Comedian faces criticism after controversial remarks at DC Gala. The Washington Post. Michelle Wolf's caustic comedy routine at the White House Correspondents Dinner. TheGuardian.com. Michelle Wolf shocks media with Sarah Sanders' attack. Deadline Hollywood. Michelle Wolf scorches White House Correspondents Dinner. You know, it's interesting to me. It's fascinating. In a day and age where freedom of speech is becoming more and more restricted, and I'll talk about that in a moment, being nasty with what we say and who we say it to is becoming more and more free. So there's some things that are almost illegal to say. You get kicked out of school, punished, and sued. But other things, you could speak to the press secretary like this of the United States of America, and that's, that's okay. Very interesting. So I, I thought on it, and I realized, you know, speech is being restricted. I'm, I'll introduce you to that in just a moment in an amazing way. But it's not to benefit people. They're all like safe space and don't hurt people's feelings. Speech is being restricted to brainwash people. Don't, don't be fooled. And those things that they don't need to help brainwash people, say whatever you want. So this video called The Least Free Place in America by De Dennis Prager's Prager University will introduce you to the idea that speech is being curtailed horribly and it's being done to brainwash you. Let's take a look. We could kill the lights. Free speech on a college campus? Here's what the Supreme Court said in 1957 in the landmark case Sweezy v. New Hampshire. Teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, otherwise our civilization will stagnate and die. Inspiring words and true. Which is why what's happening in American colleges and universities is so disturbing. A study conducted by the Association of American Colleges and Universities in 2010 revealed that only 30% of college seniors strongly agreed with the question, is it safe to hold unpopular positions on this campus? Worse, the study found that students' confidence that they can hold unpopular opinions declines from freshman to senior year. How can it be that at a place where speech should be the most free, the university, Young people fear merely holding to say nothing of actually expressing unpopular opinions. The reason is that for decades now, students have been sent a clear message from their schools. Express dissenting opinions, violate political correctness, or even just criticize the administration at your peril. After working for 12 years at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, I have seen hundreds of examples of students in peril. Here are just a few. At Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, a student employee was found guilty of racial harassment for publicly reading a book that some of his fellow employees found offensive. The book was Notre Dame versus the Klan, and it was available in the school's library. It recounted and celebrated the defeat of the Ku Klux Klan when its members marched on Notre Dame in 1924. So what did the university find offensive? The photo on the book's cover. At the University of Delaware, students were forced to undergo ideological re-education as part of the university's compulsory student orientation program. The program was described as treatment for students with incorrect attitudes and beliefs. Students were taught to adopt highly specific university-approved views on politics, race, sexuality, sociology, moral philosophy, and environmentalism. They were also required to attend one-on-one -on -one meetings with their resident assistants 
where they were compelled to answer intrusive, probing, and utterly irrelevant personal questions such as, when did you discover your sexual identity? And an increasing number of schools are trying to drive religious students off campus. Vanderbilt University, for example, has enacted a policy that forbids faith-based student groups from selecting members and leaders based on their faith. As a result, 14 Christian groups have been de-recognized by the university. Then there are speech codes at a majority of American colleges and universities. What is a speech code? It is a university regulation or policy that limits or bans expression, written or verbal, that is protected under the First Amendment. Such codes are applied with glaring double standards against religious, conservative, or politically incorrect speech, or simply speech that a particular campus administration happens to dislike. In other words, there are things you are completely free to say and write off campus that will get you in serious trouble if you say or write them on campus. These codes include policies that ban speech that administrators find insulting or offensive. One absurd code that appeared at multiple universities banned inappropriately directed laughter. And in Orwellian fashion, some schools even limit free speech to tiny sections of campus called free speech zones. Recently, at the University of Central Arkansas, you were subject to disciplinary action if you said or did something deemed annoying to another student. In the most extensive study yet conducted of campus speech codes, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education found that 62% of America's top colleges maintain serious restrictions on written and verbal expression that violate First Amendment protections. What are the consequences of all this censorship by colleges and universities? I explain that in detail in my book, Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate. But for our purposes here, I will focus on just three. First, campus censorship teaches students that they have a right not to be offended. The moment society says that people have the right not to be offended, it is announced the end of the right to free speech. Second, campus censorship teaches students poor intellectual habits. It teaches them not to think critically lest they arrive at a conclusion or express a thought that might offend someone. Further, students are taught to ignore the timeless principle that educated people should actively seek out intelligent people with whom they disagree for debate and discussion. And third, it teaches students that they have fewer rights than they actually have, that they must defer to arbitrary authority. A generation of students who don't know their rights and believe they must get permission before speaking their minds is not thinking like a free people, and that is a threat to a free society. The rights embodied in the First Amendment shape American society. They foster America's religious and cultural pluralism, spur scientific and scholarly innovation, and thus secure our remarkable prosperity. But today's universities, with their censorship, speech codes, and political correctness, are putting the future of this unique experiment in freedom at risk. This is the very opposite of what American higher education was founded to do. I'm Greg Lukianoff, president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education for Prager University. Join Prager University, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for free at PragerU.com. I tend to think this horrible restriction of speech, which isn't just happening on colleges, workplaces, uh, uh, elementary schools, is one of the reasons President Trump won, because he swung the pendulum the other direction. And I'm not saying everybody or anybody approves of what he says all the time, but people are sick of being told what they can't say and being manipulated and brainwashed. Here's what the Constitution says. He mentioned the First Amendment a couple times. Let me read it to you. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I'm a big free speech proponent. That's the Constitution of the uh, United States. Let me read to you from a higher authority. See what the Bible says about free speech. You're going to be surprised at what I come up with. James chapter 3. We all stumble in many ways. If someone is never at fault in what he says, he's the perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So the tongue is hard to control, but we must strive. I mean, people are made in God's image. We're not supposed to curse them. So the Bible is full of things we're not supposed to say. The Bible is full of things we are supposed to say. So I tell you, the Bible is against unrestrained freedom of speech. The Bible emphasizes self-control. That's the key. The Bible tells me to control myself, not for me to control you. I can't tell you how to talk, but the Bible tells you how to talk. So the Bible emphasizes self-control with our speech. And the Bible would have us use our speech for good, not for evil, like Ephesians 4 says. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful and building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So, as I go through the rest of this, uh, this lesson, I want to talk about what the Bible says about our freedom of speech, how we should curtail it, things we should not say, and things that we should. So to start us off, what should we not say? No unwholesome talk should come out of our mouths. Only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs. Our words should build up, edify, not tear down, destroy. It says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. How would you define unwholesome? I really don't know how to define that because it varies. It's not set in concrete. Sometimes words are acceptable in a given context, that they're not acceptable in another context, and they're all culturally and linguistically based. A foul word here might not be foul in England, though it's the same language. Heck, a foul word at a dog show isn't foul, but it is in church. A child whose parentage is unknown, that's just a genealogical word, but it's become a foul word in our language. It's, it's subjective, I'll give you that. We don't need to make a list. What we need to do is follow the principles. Is it building people up? Is it edifying? Is it helpful? Here's what rotten or unwholesome word means in the Greek. Rotten. So that Greek word means don't use rotten or putrefied words. That is words that are corrupted and no longer fit for use. It even means worn out. Words that are of poor quality, bad, unfit for use, worthless. So the word bad, worthless, not fit for use, give us the big picture of the kind of words we should avoid, the kind of discussions we should avoid. We already talked about cursing in James. And then Paul adds obscenity and coarse joking to his list in Ephesians 5.4. He says, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So here's how it's all shaping up on the no list so far. No freedom of speech we should not use as believers, as followers of Jesus, unwholesome talk. We shouldn't use obscenity. We shouldn't tell bad jokes. I don't mean the kind Ted tells. <laughs> I mean the kind with bad words attached to them. We shouldn't use foolish talk. So coarse jesting and foolish talk are translated differently in different translations. The New American Standard put it this way. It says, filthiness, silly talk, or coarse jesting. The Good News Bible says, language which is obscene, profane, or vulgar. Our conversation should be more like Colossians 4, 6 says. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Are you beginning to see the pattern? It's not about these are the 10 words never to use. It's more about here's the general principle on how we should use our mouths, generally speaking. Words can harm or words can heal. If you've ever been cut 
deep with somebody's words. Can I see your hand? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Now, if you've ever been built up, inspired, or encouraged by somebody's words, can I see your hands? Yeah. Words can harm or heal. They can build up or tear down. They can encourage or discourage. Proverbs 15, 4 says, Kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. As a follower of Jesus, do you want to be a spirit crusher or a life bringer? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. God is of life. This devil is of death. We don't want to be, we don't want to hurt people with our words. And it's not just bad words in the sense of obscene or vulgar, discouraging words. Ted, don't take up the guitar again, man. It's been 10 years. You're never going to be as good as you used to be. There's nothing foul in that. But if somebody had told that to him when he got back on the worship team, he might have said, "Eh, yeah, you're right. I won't do it. I know Jose, Pastor Jose, uh, Ted's predecessor, had put down the guitar for years and he decided to pick it up again and he built a great team. And we got to watch him grow, getting his magic back. It was cool. Use your words in such a way to encourage, to inspire, to build people up. Ted's been talking in the adult Bible study and I think Pastor Michael has as well in the man cave uh, about being purposeful about it. In other words, I don't want to just tell you, don't use bad words. Try hard to use good words. Go out of your way to build people up. You know, kind of like I did this morning and, and praising the team. Do that. It's easy not to, but make it a point to do it. Do it to your spouse. Do it to your kids. Do it to the grocery clerk. Do it to your waitress. You know, just tell people to have a a great day. Put a smile on their face. Or as Toby Mac would say, the great philosopher Toby Mac, (laughs) speak life. Two words, beautiful words. And by the way, those words have inspired me and have encouraged me time and time again. The world is getting more crass as speech is being restricted. Very interesting. But we are not of the world. Just because the world is getting more crass doesn't mean we should. We should be countercultural, countercrassual. Nah, it doesn't work. Step it back. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how important is it that we watch what we say? Words in red. Jesus said, you can be sure that on the judgment day, you will have to give an account of every useless word you have ever spoken. Your words will be used to judge you, to declare you either innocent or guilty. The hard hard part about that, those words in red, account of every useless word you have ever spoken. It doesn't raise the bar very high, does it? It says, if you ever curse, well, it doesn't say that. Every useless word, every idle word, It's like in a book, and it's on the build-up column or the tear-down column, and we'll give an account. Watching what we say pleases God, and watching what we say can bless us. Jesus' disciple Peter said, he wrote this down, don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. It's straightforward. I like what it says. But I like the contemporary English version. It says, don't be hateful. Don't insult people just because they're hateful and insult you. Instead, treat everyone with kindness. You are God's chosen ones, and he will bless you. The scriptures say, Don't, do you really love life? Do you want to be happy? Then stop saying cruel things and quit telling lies. You are God's chosen ones, and he will bless you. You are a fountain in the courtyard of heaven. What kind of water should we be spitting out? 
All right, back to our list. No unwholesome talk, no obscenity, no coarse joking. As the New American Standard put it, filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting are out. Or the good news, obscene, profane, or vulgar. That's not for us. What is for us? Words, oh, it's on the right side, my right. Yeah, you're right. What is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And Thanksgiving, I kind of passed over that one. It was in a verse I read, but it was there. And then Colossians 4, 6 says, let your words or your conversation be always full of grace, grace seasoned with salt. And then Proverbs 15, 4, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. Kindness is a thing. And that's one of the places I wish our president would start changing his approach. I like that he's opening up free speech again, but he has not yet learned that kindness is the way we should be going. Now, I just scratched the surface of what the scripture says about our speech. But you get the point. I don't need to give you every passage, but you can go read them if you want to and check them all out. I suppose the most powerful Verse, the one that sums it up the best to me, is Ephesians 4.29, and it says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to be fountains that pour forth pure water. May our conversations always be seasoned with salt, full of grace, and may we make it our goal in life to build others up with our talk. Lord, don't let us have peace until we obey you in this. And if that's your desire too, then say amen. All right. I made such a deal of it, I didn't forget communion this week. 